I think now you can see this. Yeah, they're, they're moving yes, now, yes. Okay. So, comment on this culture report. It's okay. Ma'am, so from beginning, ma'am. So, this is a two-year-old female child brought with complaints of on and off fever since one month, which are high-grade intermittent fevers, cough for 15 days and dull activity for one week. This child was admitted outside for two weeks with the complaints of fever and where they managed the child as culture positive UTI with gentamicin and polystyrene. Uh, in spite of giving sensitive antibiotics, the child had persistent fever spikes. So they required the child for further management. So this is the culture, urine culture report of this child, which, uh, which isolated Klebsiella pneumonia and colony count is significant. So these are the this is the sensitivity pattern. Which antibiotic you would like to choose for this child? Ma'am, Miropinam, ma'am. Okay. Why? Ma'am, culture report is showing they are sensitive for the Miropinam. Ceftriaxone uh, is resistant for Ceftriaxone. Either Miropinam or can uh, we select nitrofurantoin also, ma'am? Okay. This child is having fever since almost one month and the child has uh, other complaints also. Uh, child being so sick for so long, like better we start the IV antibiotics rather than oral. Yes, Miropinum is a good choice. Uh, you can go for a combination also. Miro or Emicacin like that. Yes. So ma'am, nitrofurantoin coming in only oral, ma'am, not in IV. Yes. Nitrofurantoin coming in oral or IV, ma'am? Oral, oral. Okay, ma'am. Hmm. So coming to initial impression, uh, the tail appearance is dull. Uh, color, the, there is pallor and breathing wise, child has tachypnea. So, what is the physiological status? Mm -hmm. And what intervention, uh, like, do you want to intervene or you want to go ahead for your primary assessment? So, except for some amount of tachypnea and a paler uh, child is otherwise okay. So, if you like, we can start oxygen, otherwise we can go for primary assessment. So, on primary assessment, the airway is maintained, uh, breathing, there is uh, tachypnea with uh, bilateral uh, occasional threats, but child maintaining saturation is more than 98% at room height. Circulation wise, uh, normal except for tach uh, tachycardia, which we can attribute to fever of 101. And GCS is normal and the GRBS is also normal. So what intervention you want to do here? Ma'am, mm. we give anti-pyretic, ma'am. Their fever is 101, ma'am. Okay, we can, yes. Yes, we can secure an IV access. Uh, control fever with uh, like uh, collect uh, blood samples. We can give IV paracetamol and before uh, giving first dose of IV antibiotics, always uh, send blood culture before first dose of antibiotics. So here is a child presenting with fever uh, for almost four weeks. So what is the choice of antibiotics you want to start for this child? Neuropinum plus Mcasin, ma'am. Okay, you want to start Neuropinum plus Mcasin. Why? In broad spectrum antibiotic, which covers gram positive, gram negative, all, ma'am. Yes. Yes, Neuropinum is a good choice. And uh, child presented with fever for four, four weeks. So, Neuropinum is a good choice. So, 
on secondary assessment the child has pallor like pallor is there and there is puffiness of cheeks and pedal edema and anthropometry wise she is fitting into severe acute malnutrition and other findings are hepatomegaly cervical lymphadenopathy and hypopigmented hair uh, which was thought to be secondary to malnutrition so this is the child uh, like almost four to five days after admission she looks severely emaciated and this is her hair what can you see in her hair white pigmentation ma'am mm. yes pigmented hair what could be the possibility mm. flag sign ma'am okay so you are thinking, you are thinking it is a condition okay any other dds for this white hair like uh, here so you so marasmus ma'am Yes, Ashwarkar or Marasmus, definitely malnutrition is one cause. So what are the possible DDs? So what could be the possible DDs in this chain? Severe acute malnutrition, more prone for infection or any primary immune deficiency state. Okay, you are thinking it to be secondary to some primary immune deficiency. Okay, before that, okay, any other possible DD? So, child has previously culture positive UTA, so it should be uh, like. Uh, yeah, complicated UTI, uh, one possibility. Second thing could be any child is admitted for 15 days. So it could be any hospital acquired infection. And another possibility is any bacterial or viral infections. It could be secondary to any inflammatory causes or any infiltrative disorders. So these are the possible DDs. Uh, what we thought at the time of presentation. So what is the definition of uh, PPO in a child? Fever with unknown origin, continuous fever for more than seven days. Yes. What is the definition of classic PPO? Classical PEO definition is fever for more than three weeks, uh, uh, like uh, with a temperature spikes more than 38 degrees centigrade or 100.4 degree Fahrenheit and documented in a medical setting. And even after two hospital visits are more than one week of hospitalization. That is classical PEO definition. And uh, for currently for work, uh, like working, we can uh, consider FEO as uh, Fever more than say 38 degrees centigrade or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit documented by healthcare worker that, that last longer than eight days without any clear source. So, what are the common causes of PUO in children? Mm. What are the common causes of PEO in children? It can be divided into infectious and non-infectious. So, um, coming under infectious, they can be again bacterial, viral, or other causes. And uh, in non-infectious, it can be oncological or autoimmune or other causes.
So how do you approach a child with uh, piracy of unknown origin? Presenting with uh, you are of unknown origin, uh, main role will be played by your appropriate history taking and examination. What history you want to ask? Me? What history you want to ask in this shell about fever? And from how many times? Uh... Ma'am, uh, earlier it was admitted with the UTI, so we will ask related to UTI questions, UTI related questions, ma'am, whether any pain, dysuria is present, any color of the urine. Uh, okay. And uh, like, uh, what history will ask, uh, what other history will ask for any child presenting with PEO? Like we don't know the exact cause. So first comes your type of fever. Like uh, what is the type of fever, whether it is intermittent or continuous. And uh, next any sign, localizing signs and symptoms or any other symptoms in absence of any localizing symptoms. Any other possible symptoms which parents observed uh, during the illness. And there is importance to, again, uh, geographic location where the child lives. Uh, and any tra recent travel history. And we should, <clears throat> we should also ask history considering zoonotic diseases and any contact history for any respiratory infections. And finally, drug history. And what exam... What to do in uh, seeing clinical examination? What is the importance of organomegaly in PEO? Like if the child has hepatomegaly, what could be the possible causes fever with hepatomegaly? Dengue, fever. malaria, enteric fever. Viral hepatitis, ma'am. Yes. And it can be seen in even some infiltrative disorders, uh, diseases and uh, inflammatory conditions also, uh, like uh, lymphomas, leukemias. And sphenomegaly, what is the significance of fever, sphenomegaly? Again, infective causes like uh, <clears throat> malaria, typhus fever. Uh, again, infiltrative causes like leukemia, lymphomas can present with sphenomegaly. Uh, even your HLH, uh, secondary HLH. Uh, so one of the criteria for HLH is uh, sphenomegaly. So next, murmurs. Presence of uh, murmur indicates like uh, any infective endocarditis. And uh, your relative bradycardia, you seen in uh, enteric fever and malaria. So what is the importance of conjunctivitis with fever? With you know virus, ma'am, we can suspect it, you know virus. Uh, any other virus? Fever, conjunctivitis, septin bar virus. So EBV, conjunctivitis, conjunctival subfusion, dry eyes are more commonly seen in infl inflammatory diseases like autoimmune uh, autoimmune conditions. And uh, uh, abnormal fundoscopy findings uh, you will see in tuberculosis, uh, inflammatory conditions. And what is the significance of lymphadenopathy? No. Even inflammatory disorders, uh, inka, uh, viral infections like EBV infection, fever, lymphadenopathy, 
orthonomegaly, uh, like more classical for EVA infection. So sometimes skin changes and uh, musculoskeletal changes, right? Uh, like in osteomyelitis, uh, bone tenderness. Uh, there we can see all of all these findings. So uh, clear history and uh, uh, regular clinical examination are, uh, are the key. Uh, they will guide you, like they will narrow down your investigations. So what investigations you want to send for this child? So this child presented with fever for four weeks, initially had UTA, uh, like not normal cbc with peripheral smear ma'am crp esr okay. blood culture okay urine culture ma'am mm. so any child present yes if you not find anything go to the montux test tvsg abdomen ma'am and chest x-ray okay so any child presenting with uh Fever of unknown origin, we can uh, classify the investigations as first type, second type, and third type. So we can, if you if you couldn't narrow down and uh, you couldn't come down to the diagnosis after first type of investigation, then you can support like or like you can narrow down after first type. You can uh, do uh, which uh, required second type investigations, and then it required third third type investigations. So always your first level of investigations will be like already uh, uh, you discussed complete pet blood count with peripheral smear, blood cultures, uh, CRP, ESR, and LFTs, RFTs, and urine analysis and chest x -ray. So your second line, second type investigations includes the uh, echo, 2D echo, abdominal ultrasound, and uh, viral BPS like for us. Uh, Cytomegalovirus, Epstein Barr virus, Proxoplasma, and uh, work up for TB. And these are the third level investigations. So these are the third tier of investigations. These include uh, investigations of uh, autoimmune disorder, diseases and uh, any localizing uh, uh, tests, localizing tests like chest or abdominal CT or the CT PNS or X-ray PNS or bone marrow, bone marrow aspiration and biopsy or uh, trans transagial echocardiography. So for this child, uh, uh, hemoglobin is 7 grams and total counts are elevated with normal platelets and creatinine is 3.4 and urea is 171. So serum albumin is 1.8 and uh, there is an elevated CRP of 240. And urine, there are around eight to nine parcels with one test leukocytes and two D echo shown normal EF without any vegetations. And ultrasound abdomen, uh, there is mild hepatomegaly. So this is the chest X-ray of this day. It's like almost normal except for some very high infiltrates. So, so ma'am, in this case, we go through only first tier investigation, ma'am. not like we can go through on the first time investigation. Uh, after first time investigations, along with your clinical history and diet, like in clinical history examination and first time investigations, uh, like you will get an idea to what other investigations if you want, like you want to do. Uh, for this child, uh, after first time investigations, yes, we could come, see, let us see what happened in this child. Yes. So we started the child on neurofilm levoflop and doxycycline and uh, uh, her HB is 7. So we gave a TRPC transfusion, albumin transfusion was given. Uh, for her uh, uh, child initially had eyelid puffiness, fetal edema with elevated uh, creatinine and urea. Uh, but urine output is good. It is non alguric KKA and uh, we could conservatively manage it. Uh, like we stopped the drug. Uh, restricted flu. Uh, so with conservative management, uh, it came down. Uh, creatinine levels decreased to normal. And we even sent leptospira serology and LP was done as the child is always le lethargic and CSF analysis is normal.
So, but for this cell, blood culture isolated pseudomonas. Uh, this is the sensitive pattern of the blood culture isolated. So, what is the antibiotic of choice for this cell? Neuropenem is sensitive. Uh, even we some we can go for a combination also. Neuro plus chemical cell. Uh, so for this cell, we started cell on neuropenem and ciprofloxacin. And uh, so there is response. There is a decrease in the severity and number of fever spikes. And even general condition is better, uh, but child left side didn't improve much. So, ma'am, why you select neuropenem plus ciprofloxacin? You, you, we can, if you take a emcasin, it cover gram negative also. Man. Why ciprofloxacin with neuropenem? But we started the child on neurofloxacin before the before blood culture report. So we suspected hospital acquired infection. So it is our child, like we opted for levofloxacin. And again, child is already in uh, renal failure, like uh, AKA, uh, sorry, not in renal failure, child is in AKA. He has uh, uh, elevated urea, creatinine, and mm -hmm. yes, yes. are there. So along with neurofinum, we choose levofloxacin. And there is a response. Okay, ma'am. So we continue Miro and levofloxacin. And even CRP is in decreasing trend. Just one minute, go to me. Sure. Yeah, the, the, that's a valid question. Uh, exactly. The amikacin is the uh, ideal choice for pseudomonas if it's sensitive. But as uh, Gautami told, it is because of the AK we avoided amikacin. And in, in initial choice also, why we choose meropinum and levofloxacin is because of the AK region. And we are suspecting hospital acquired bugs. All the hospital acquired bugs are most likely to be resistant to the first line or second line antibiotics. So it's most likely they will be responding to ES bill organisms. So for ES, if you suspect hospital local infection, you cannot go for the lower level of antibiotics. You need to go for higher level of antibiotics. And the first choice comes is meropinum, the child is sick. And second choice, if you add to amacacin, you want to add vancomycin, you want to add other things, is based on your uh, local pathology. You, are, you are want to call gram negative versus gram positive, you need to choose mero with vanco. If you want to cover only gram negative, the our unit is like a more of gram negative. So we'll choose more of gram negative uh, uh, drugs like miropinam, methamycacinam, you know, with the level of loxin. And depending on the AKA, you have to choose that thing. So in which zone AKA is there, so we choose a level of loxin, not uh, amycacin. So that is the main reason. And the question is very valid. So everyone has to question like that. Why, why this antibiotic? Why not that antibiotic? That's what we need to develop. So then only we can uh, improve ourselves. Continue. Ah, thank you. So this is a beautiful algorithm. Uh, like we can follow whenever a child presents with uh, prolonged fevers. So uh, if the uh, any child presenting with fever more than eight days and without any identifiable source, uh, even after eight days, if the child is uh, well appearing, we can work up. If the child is sick looking, we can admit and uh, start managing the child in the hospital. Uh, so here we admitted the child as she's sick and we start sent investigations. So <clears throat> here we could come to the diagnosis. Uh, uh, initially, after initial workup, uh, we, uh, like after initial blood culture, we could identify the source that child has a bloodstream infection, pseudomonas. So we started the child, <clears throat> child is on, started the child empirically on IV antibiotics for which she started responding. Uh, so we continued the IV antibiotics. So despite giving sensitive antibiotics, this child continues to continue to have one or two fever spikes per day. And child used to be dull and less interactive. And even her appetite is also poor. So we sent a repeat bed culture which is sterile. <clears throat> so, ma'am, for repeat blood culture, uh, how many days we wait, wait ma'am? So, usually, if there is no clinical response, uh, like uh, after 48 hours, we can send a repeat blood culture. So, this child, uh, we sent a repeat blood culture 
after five uh, like after five days four to five days man if a percentage on the miropin amine sip sip one another antibiotic still we send blood culture it is rational ma'am and yeah it's a very valid question actually you, what what you are asking is a very valid question so you tell me uh, I, i want to ask you one question here and uh, if your child is not responding to your antibiotics like say the partial response what you are going to do with this child what you are going to whatever dd is here in mm. you identified pseudomonas you are giving sense to antibiotics uh, but still child is having partial response so anyone anyone can chip in so what were the dds we need to keep here infection wise child is admitted in the hospital we have grown pseudomonas and the antibiotics what we started is sense to all the report is there and still uh, child is not that response initially child had response uh, our child is still continuing the fevers so what we need to think and this Don't some resistant 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 exactly, exactly. so we need to think of that secondary antibiotic resistance or hospital acquired infection yes so understood so you your dd the first for first dd here is not the other cause of pvo the first dd here is whether the bug is still response to the drugs or i got a new bug hospital acquired yeah Sir. So that's why the blood cells is the first investigation you need to send in this child before sending other investigations because the pseudomonas now it is become resistant because pseudomonas is the one bug which can have resistance very easily. So if, after two days initially there is a response miropinum after two days the, it got mutated now the miropinum is not responsive. Then child Sir, again will have more fever. In first space. blood culture, I think in first blood culture it is. A- Uh, given that sensitive to cholesterol, so uh, without uh, sending second repeat culture, blood culture. No, 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 no. That is not the right thing. You okay. can, you cannot assume things. I so because in the first blood culture, you have a guard sensitive to mirror opinion, child should respond. There is no question. If the report comes sensitive, then it should come. It should respond. But if it's not responding, that means there is an alternation in the organism, or there is a new organism. because if you assume that uh, this child is because only pseudomonas become resistant i feel it is hospital located infection it could be klebsiella it could be asthma okay sir. you got my point if, yes. if, if it's pseudomonas fine but if it's not pseudomonas is pseudomonas get cleared and child got new infection so okay. until unless you have repeat blood culture you cannot assume things that's what i'm telling so always always better to send a culture and see yourself whether you, you clear the organism or you got a new organism or the same organism which is become resistant okay sir. i think i am clear on what i am telling yes sir thanks yeah so what could be the possibilities here after ruling out uh, like resistant bug or uh, another hospital acquired infection so what could be the possibilities think think you have a new finding here so which is not there at admission child developed a new finding here so that is the key finding we need should not miss and based on that we need to have our dds infective endocarditis any other possibilities what are the other possibilities hlh yes uh, hlh is one possibility uh, the, what could be the other dds so we any, have mm-hmm. we have to think where the spleen is which causes the spleen to get in because splenomegaly was not uh, earlier present okay so any splenomeg uh, any child admitted to uh, hospital uh, most common cause could be thrombocolitis 
infective endocarditis. So, you know, trauma clematis could be one possibility. So, again, <clears throat> malaria, uh, HLH, as you already told, and uh, drug fever, uh, which is uh, like diagnosed by exclusion, and the possibility of Epstein Barr virus infection. So, this tail head admission has uh, like prolonged fevers and lymphadenopathy, and now developed the finding of uh, splenomegaly. Uh, so, there is a possibility of EBV infection. And for other possibilities could be lymphoma. So infective endocarditis, uh, as uh, uh, like uh, you are asking, there is no infective endocarditis in this shade. Like e, like serial echoes are normal. So what what workup to be planned for this shade now? So these are your possible dailies. What what investigations you would like to send? Serum triglycerides, serum ferritin. Serum triglyceride ferritin. Yes. Or bone marrow. HLH and bone marrow. Yes. Uh, so, so for HLH, you want to send serum ferritin, triglycerides, and uh, this For malaria, we will send QVC, ma'am. Mm, yes. So for EBV infection, we send EBV PCR. So for lymphoma and HLH, uh, like we, we can go for a bone marrow. So what are the diagnostic criteria for HLH? Um, serum ferritin should be more than 500. Yes. And uh, triglyceride it should be more, ma'am. I'm not exact value, do not remember, ma'am. Uh, okay. So what are the other uh, criteria for HLS? Two more, ma'am. Four, actually. Four or five criteria. Persisting fever spikes, uh, splenomegaly. Yes. By cytopenia. Yes. So this child doesn't have any by cytopenia, right? Her counts are elevated. Uh, no thrombocytopenia. Only hemoglobin is uh, uh, less. Uh, which could be attributed to prolonged fever, decreased appetite. So, uh, does the child still fit into HLH? So, definitely. So, my side opinion is not an uh, exclusive criteria. So, we can have any five. Uh, five criteria out of the site. So, fever, splenomegaly, bicytopenia, and hypertriglycidemia or hypofibrinogenemia, and uh, hemophagocytes in bone marrow, and absent uh, NK cell activity, hyperferritinemia, and elevated soluble CD5 levels. So, five criteria are enough. So, now we have fever and splenomegaly. Uh, so, we sent uh, triglycerides and ferritin levels, which are also high. Uh, so then we go, then we went for bone marrow aspiration. So these are the criteria fulfilled in this child. So this child has fever, splenomegaly, hyperferritinemia, elevated triglycerides, and bone marrow aspiration then <clears throat> suggests you of uh, macrophages with evidence of focal hemophagocytes, and there is no no bicytopenia is observed in this child. So whenever we come, we, we come to the no, bicytopenia means any any like any of the two lines, either anemia or anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia. So any of the two lines are uh, like suppressed. The two cytopenias is there. We we'll consider it as bicytopenia. Okay. So, Whenever a DD of uh, HLH comes to the mind, by that time we will all we, like we all always will have counts in our hands. So that bicytopenia, like we will be knowing. So sometimes if bicytopenia is there, not there, we'll bypass the diagnosis of HLH. But this child uh, uh, like showed the importance that even in absence of bicytopenia, we should look for other possibilities. So with the uh, like this child is uh, having the 
QTI accepts it. So we consider that in secondary HLH as a possibility. And uh, serial examinations, uh, initially there is no splenomegaly, even on ultrasound abdomen. So after a few days after admission, we notice that child is having splenomegaly. So with fever, splenomegaly, even if there is no myocytopenia, we consider HLH as a possibility. So when we sent other investigations, so the child fit in, uh, like she fit into HLH. Ma'am, before considering HLH, can we uh, think in the direction of malaria, ma'am? A percentage in severe malaria percent also become uh, uh, dull and uh, whether we done test in QVC here, ma'am? Yes, we have sent workup for all these DDs. We sent investigations for repeat malaria. We sent the peripheral smear also, repeat peripheral smear. We ruled out all these causes. Even we sent TPV, PCR. So we did a bone marrow. So we worked up for all these DDs. Okay, ma'am. So what are, uh, HLH can be primary or secondary. So primary HLH is usually autosomal recessive uh, condition and uh, secondary HLH is usually secondary to infection or malignancies or rheumatological disorders or in even metabolic conditions. So what is the common, uh, uh, like uh, common infectious cause for secondary HLH? Dengue. Yes, we have seen the uh, secondary HLH even in dengue children. Like we commonly see. Mm -hmm. Another? EBV. EBV. Yes. yes, exactly. EBV is the most common cause of secondary HLH. It accounts for almost 40% of cases of secondary HLH. Then comes the remaining infections. So anyway, uh, like, what is the treatment of HLH? So this child, uh, she is fitting into uh, second uh, HLH. So we need to start treatment. What what medication you want to give? IV HLH. Intravenous immunoglobulins. Anything else? Methylprednisolone can be tried if it is a, in a resource limited settings. Yes. So, like according to Histocyte Society, uh, like HLH studies and HLH 2004 studies, uh, like the advisor protocols are dexamethasone and etoposide for eight weeks induction therapy, uh, followed by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And again, uh, uh, whether a child needs a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or not depends upon the uh, remission. Like uh, uh, if the child is otherwise normal after the end of your uh, induction therapy with dexamethasone, uh, like uh, we can consider whether child needs uh, stem cell transplantation or not. So in patients with CNS disease, uh, advised treatment is intrathecal methotrexate and steroids. And there are many other new drugs in the pipeline. And anakinra is indicated in uh, HLS secondary to inflammatory diseases. And rituximab is uh, helpful in treatment for EBV-related HLH. So this is the dose of dexamethasone. Uh, so total duration of eight weeks and etoposide. Initially, we start with 10 mg per meter square per day for one to two weeks and slowly we'll taper and stop by eight weeks. And if the child needs hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, we should put her on a continuation phase, which is 10 mg per meter square per day for uh, three days a week. Sorry. So what could be the causes of HLH in this child?
For this child, we started the child on injection dexamethasone and we didn't start titofosite. Uh, like uh, previously also, there are studies showing, uh, uh, you can see a response to steroids alone. And for this child, we didn't start titofosite because this child has uh, ongoing infection. So we started only dexamethasone and waited for response. And we tried to look into the causes of HLH. Uh, one thing we identified is uh, this child uh, EBB, EBB, EBB PCR uh, came positive. So it is uh, uh, second, HLH secondary to EBV infection. And uh, another possibility also we identified in this child. Uh, can you see any abnormality in this picture? So this picture we also discussed uh, initially about her hair. So any abnormal hair finding you could identify here? No, ma'am. Anyone? Silver, silver hair, ma'am. Yeah. Whitening, ma'am. Yes. Silvery gray hair, which we identified initially, and we thought like uh, possible possible due to malnutrition, like probably secondary to malnutrition. So, what could be the causes of silvery gray hair? Any DDs? Any DDs for silvery gray hair? Don't know, man. Okay. So possible causes of silvery gray hair are one is Disley syndrome and Chinakigashi syndrome and Hermanaski Pudner syndrome and Elagendi syndrome. All these syndromes are associated with primary immunodeficiency. So, under microscopy, the hair shaft above is a picture of uh, uh, like normal hair. Under microscopy, below is a silvery gray hair where uh, there will be accumulation of melanosomes in the medulla. So this is the hair picture in this child, this picture uh, where uh, in the medulla there is accumulation of melanosomes. This is the microscopy of normal hair. So. When we looked into the approach, like uh, uh, like any child had with the silvery gray hair, uh, there is associated immunological deficiency. So in this child, yes, there is a recurrent infection. So for this child, if there is any... Just one minute. Uh, okay. yeah. And uh, that, that image of uh, clumping of melanocytes is uh, very specific for gracilis. You have different types of uh, 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 microscopic findings in different diseases. And this finding, what uh, we have shown is uh, mainly for Gracilis syndrome. So by examining the hair, you can easily differentiate what kind of uh, what kind of disease you are dealing. So there's a different finding in uh, uh, your cardiac high gas And there's a different finding in Ejalde and a different finding in uh, Gracilis. So apart from the clinical feature difference, you can have hair uh, feature difference as well. It's a light microscopic. It is not a microscope. It's just a light microscope. Even you can you can identify. Uh, these are the pictures uh, taken by us only, not by a pathologist or an expert person. So this easily you can do in your microscope, in your lab microscope. Okay. Continue, Gautam. So any child presenting with silvery gray hair. So we are suspecting an associated immunological deficiency. Uh, yes, uh, then this child has features of HLH. And when there is a HLH features present, we should look for giant lysosomes in peripheral sphere, uh, which are absent. So this child is fitting into Griselli syndrome too. And uh, Griselli syndrome is associated with uh, 
primary HLH, it is an autosomal recessive condition. So after discussing with the hematologist, uh, we started the child on rituximab for uh, HLH secondary to EBV infection. So we continued dexamethasone, started rituximab, and planned for the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation after retaining remission. There are many studies uh, showing uh, efficacy of uh, rituximab in uh, HLS secondary to EBV infection. And dose is 375 mg per meter square. So these are few other studies uh, showing the uh, role of uh, rituximab in uh, EBV HLH. So this is the child after uh, almost four weeks of uh, rituximab therapy. So after starting on rituximab, child improved, uh, counts decreased, spleen size also reduced, and uh, child uh, genomic sequencing confirmed Griselli syndrome type two. So uh, like we are planning for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as early as possible. So like we can compare how she looks initially and how she looks now. So this is the genomic sequencing report of this child uh, confirmed the Griselli syndrome type 2. So what is the take home message from this child? So this child uh, tells us the importance of uh, regular uh, clinical examination, how it is important. So this child doesn't have splenomegaly initially. So initially, like we, we treated for sex, uh, like UTI. So then she acquired hospital acquired infection. Uh, like uh, we, we managed the child for the uh, uh, sepsis. Then still with the persisting fever spikes, with the regular physical examinations, we, we found the child had splenomegaly. Uh, so we worked up for a possible diagnosis. So this child showed the importance of uh, uh, like how important physical examination, daily regular frequent physical examination is. And uh, another point is like reconsidering your diagnosis when child is not improving clinically. So child had you like UTA not responding. Like we can't continue the same drug because it is sensitive. And second time also child had sepsis, uh, giving sense to bugs. Child is better, general condition improving, but there are one or two fever spikes per day. Like she's not improving. Uh, there is no gradual improvement. So we reconsidered again a diagnosis. That is important. And considering secondary HLH in any prolonged fever. So this child doesn't have bicytopenia. So we should not uh, like leave HLH as a possibility. So any questions? No, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gautami. You have taken uh, us to a very, um, very interesting case and, uh, and another very good learning points for all of us. So there is no excuse for clinical examination. You do a number of tests, a number of investigations, but you need to direct your investigations based